Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the latest uh, in our series of uh, speakers. Uh, today, we're pleased to welcome Wes Mitchell, Dr. Wes Mitchell, principal and co-founder of the Marathon Initiative, uh, who's here to speak with us about uh, NATO's future uh, and the uh, contents of a report that he, he has co-chaired uh, uh, of the NATO 2030 Reflection Group. Uh, and before introducing Wes, let me just make a, a few words of introduction to the subject. Uh, the last few years, 10, 15, 20, depending on where you want to start the count, have proven to be unexpectedly challenging for U.S. alliances. Uh, first came the, the nuclear and missile programs of uh, neighboring regional challengers, also known as rogue states. Uh, but in the 1990s, the sudden emergence of new nuclear threats to allies in Europe and, and East Asia uh, was uh, a, a new post-Cold War challenge to U.S. alliances and to the credibility of U.S. extended deterrence guarantees. Then came the chilling of relations with their major power neighbors, first in Europe with Russia and, and now in East Asia with China. Uh, then came the, the rising awareness of uh, America's own rethinking of its alliance relationships and its uh, some partial reluctance to its uh, historical role as a security guarantor. Uh, and now we have a new administration saying to allies, we're back, we're ready to lead, um, but it's as yet unclear on precisely what direction they might seek to lead. U.S. alliances. Uh, and NATO has been through a particularly difficult patch, it seems to me, and finds itself at an, a significant inflection point. Uh, the security environment in which NATO sits has grown uh, much more complex over the last three decades. Uh, the bipolar order has given way to something where 30 allies, 31 allies, feel very different pressures from the security environment around them. Uh, and there are major new dangers to the alliance from its east, that's to say Russia, uh, but also to its south, where political order in the Middle East has eroded uh, and, and northern Africa to the point of constituting new dangers of multiple kinds. Uh, and uh, it's the internal politics of the alliance have been changed also by the fact that its uh, membership has expanded bringing in new countries with, with new interests. Uh, and accordingly, given these pressures and the emergence of this inflection point, in, uh, at their last summit in December of 2019 uh, in London, the heads of state and government of NATO member nations agreed to um, seek the advice or, or to ask the Secretary General to to create uh, an, an outside advisory group about how to respond to these changes and more broadly to advise the alliance on what chart, what course to chart as an alliance. Uh, and this uh, tasking was widely seen as preparatory to the writing of a new strategic concept for the alliance. For those not familiar with NATO, uh, it, it has a, a governing document, so to speak, a, a statement of its strategic concept, which ranges uh, from 25 paragraphs to sometimes uh, a good many more. But these strategic concepts have been updated roughly every decade or so for the Alliance. Uh, and, and it's been uh, a dozen years, 11 years since the last one was updated. That 2010 version of the strategic concept sets out the role of the alliance, the purposes of the alliance, the vision of the alliance. And in its 2010 worldview, it describes an alliance with, that's at peace, without enemies. Uh, it's a concept that emphasizes the, the possibility of further progress and deepening partnership with Russia. It conveys optimism about the role of arms control and the alliance's security strategy and optimism about the possibility of further reducing the role of nuclear weapons. Uh, conspicuously, that 
strategic concept also essentially punted on decisions about the needed, quote, appropriate mix of nuclear and non-nuclear capabilities for deterrence, which became the focus of a subsequent deterrence and defense posture review. It's time to write a new strategic concept. Uh, and this was one of the um, pr principal areas of interest for this new advisory body's report. Uh, the report of the uh, reflection group in November of this past year has attracted relatively little attention outside of narrow political circles in the capitals of members of the alliance. Uh, perhaps it's captured some attention in Moscow and maybe Beijing as well. But it deserves broader discussion and attention in, in our community because it sets out many of the ideas that are likely to be governing the direction of the alliance, particularly on its political side, for, for the decade ahead. Uh, and our speaker today served as co-chair of the Reflection Group, uh, together with a former German Minister of Defense, Thomas de Mazier. Uh, Dr. Mitchell is a principal and co-founder of the Marathon Initiative, which is a Washington, D.C.-based think tank focused on great power competition. Uh, he is also currently serving as a non-resident fellow in applied history uh, at Harvard's Belfer Center, uh, and he's a senior advisor to the United States Institute of Peace in a project uh, they're leading on strategic stability and major power relations. From 2017 to 2019, Wes served as U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs. Uh, he served prior to that time as President and CEO of the Center for European Policy Analysis. Uh, and if you haven't seen his book with Jake Greigiel, uh, Greigiel on the unquiet frontier, rising rivals, vulnerable allies and the crisis of American power. Uh, I strongly recommend it to you. I think it's one of the most important books written about major power relations uh, in the current period. Uh, Wes has a, a bachelor's degree in history from Texas Tech University, uh, a master's in German and European studies from Georgetown University, and a PhD in political science from the Free University of Berlin. We're very pleased to welcome you today, Wes. Thank you for making time to do this. Let me say to the group that Wes is going to speak for about uh, 30 to 40 minutes, uh, and then we'll turn to Q&A. If you'd like to join the conversation at that point, please uh, raise your hand electronically. That would be preferable, but if you prefer, please just send uh, me a chat function, and I'll see that your question or comment comes, in, comes into play. Wes, thanks so much for making the time to do this. Over to you. Hey Brad, thanks. Thank, thanks for uh, that introduction and, and for having me. I'm I'm really delighted to be able to join the call call today. I'm a great fan of Lawrence Livermore. I know the important work you guys do. I'm a big fan of the program there at CGSR, and especially a big fan of Brad. Um, so it's a it's a it's a real treat for me to be on the line and uh, look look forward to a good discussion. As Brad just said, the uh, the NATO Reflection Group, which I had the privilege to co-chair, uh, just wrapped up what was nine months of deliberations at the end of last year. I think we had something like 100 uh, kudos sessions, 100 VTCs, and I, I joked that we, we, we all sacrificed our retinas for NATO, but the whole thing was done virtually. Uh, we wrapped it up in um, November of last year and then gave our final report to Secretary General Stoltenberg in December. Uh, as Brad also said, the findings of their report have now had a chance to circulate pretty widely in NATO capitals. Um, th those recommendations are being uh, debated right now uh, behind closed doors in the lead up to the 2021 NATO leaders meeting uh, where Secretary General Stoltenberg will put some of them on the table uh, formally as recommendations to heads of state. Uh, and then we'll see on that basis uh, where where the alliance goes with some of these recommendations. So all of that is to say, I think the timing for our discussion today is good because the recommendations have had the chance to marinate a little bit. And in addition to just talking through what the report 
said and why, maybe we can also talk a little bit about the likelihood of uh, some of the recommendations been being taken on board or not and why. Uh, but since we have a pretty good chunk of time for the call today, what I thought I would do is, is just kind of break this into pieces and, and first talk a little bit about the origins of the project and the specific goal that we were given by Secretary General Stoltenberg, and then go over what I see as some of the main takeaways from the report, and then maybe end with uh, some short observations on how I see NATO evolving over the next few years and, and where I think the main challenges will lie from, from an explicitly U.S. strategic perspective. But, but let me say a disclaimer at the start that I uh, intend my comments today um, to, to be taken as um, only my own reflections. I'm, I'm speaking entirely for myself. I'm not presuming to speak for my co-chair, Thomas de Mazur. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not speaking for the rest of the reflection group. Um, so uh, just to, to keep that in mind as we're going through some of the material, I'm going to uh, uh, feel at liberty to share candid impressions and observations. Uh, first of all, let me say a few words about how the reflection uh, process came into being and why it was launched. Uh, many of you may know from public reporting that it came together uh, in the spring of last year, but its, its, mar its origins were a few months before that, uh, at the time of the NATO leaders meeting in December 2019 when uh, the NAC, uh, the North Atlantic uh, Council, asked Stoltenberg to commission an expert group to look at the political health of the, of the NATO alliance and provide recommendations looking out to 2030. The, the, the kind of impetus or, or spark for all of this was uh, famously uh, President Macron's comment uh, at, on the sidelines of that leaders meeting that NATO was brain dead. Uh, and he made that comment in response to, well, mainly in response to U.S. bilateral coordination with Turkey over Syria. Uh, I think the reflection process or something like it probably would have been commissioned in any event, even without Macron's comment. NATO tends to hold these kinds of expert reviews every, every so often. The last one, uh, as Brad mentioned, was the group of experts led by Madeleine Albright and Jerome Vanderveer in um, 2010. So it, the, the alliance was due for something like this. Uh, but I think Macron's comment provided the spark and, and gave the undertaking some political currency and immediacy, which, which was valuable. There, there, there has been some media focus on political turbulence in transatlantic affairs for the last few years now. Uh, and, you know, uh, President Macron's comments, comments by uh, President Trump, Erdogan, other members of NATO. And I think those have raised questions about NATO's purpose and priorities. And I, th I think, I mean, my impression, especially after completing the reflection process, is that while we tend to focus on those political currents, the questions facing NATO are, are much less about politics and personalities, which inevitably grab the most media attention, but and they're much more about structural shifts that are underway in the international balance of power, and that um, I think cast a sharper light on divergences in threat perception and priorities that have been building inside NATO for some time. But in, in any event, uh, Secretary jo General Stoltenberg was tasked by the NAC with conducting a review, launching a review, and he formed a group of 10 experts. Uh, those experts were drawn from across the alliance uh, and uh, with myself and Thomas de Mazur, former German defense minister and current member of the of German Bundestag co-chairing. And then the other members were from um, United Kingdom, France, Poland, Italy, uh, Turkey, Denmark, the Netherlands, and Canada. So it was a fairly well-rounded group. Uh, there were some concerns early on that there was insufficient representation from uh, NATO allies east of Germany. And we worked proactively to address that by uh, consulting early and often with allies uh, from Central and Eastern Europe. But the assignment that Stoltenberg gave to the reflection group was to look out to 2030 and provide recommendations for strengthening the political dimension of NATO in, in, uh, in three discrete areas. Uh, first of all, strengthening NATO's political role 
and tools with regard to uh, emerging threats. Secondly, str strengthening NATO's political cohesion and unity. And third, strengthening NATO's political consultation and decision making. Uh, I think it's important to grasp from the outset uh, what the reflection group was not asked to do. We were not asked uh, to undertake a comprehensive review of uh, the NATO alliance encompassing its military dimensions. Obviously, there are a lot of overlaps. It's, it, the deeper you get into the material, the harder it is to segment out the military and political strands. But uh, we tried to show fidelity to what was uh, an overwhelmingly political uh, mandate or, or task. And I think that's important to uh, understand because it, that narrower focus differentiates the reflection group from its immediate predecessor, the, the Albright group back in 2010. I think it also uh, differentiates our work from some of the earlier expert commissions and reflections that took place during the Cold War. And, and I will venture I mean, I, an, an observation. I think it made our job a lot harder than those earlier reviews because we were asked uh, at a time of some turbulence in um, the political goings on of NATO to give recommendations on matters that are mainly a derivative of political will rather than uh, just a question of how to use capabilities or reform institutions that assume a certain baseline of political will as those earlier groups had been had, had, had been asked. And I would note also that we were not uh, asked explicitly to prepare the way for a new strategic concept. That was to a certain extent implicit in the job we were given and the report does get into the question of the next strategic concept in some detail, and, I, and I'll elaborate on that. But the, the mandate, so to speak, was purely political. How, how do you strengthen political cohesion? Um, and it was political in the future tense. How do you strengthen political cohesion for the world of 2030? We took that formulation of the task seriously and, and really tried to stick to it. From the outset, we established inside the group that the report would not be treated or our deliberations would not be used at all as an extension by other means of the day-to-day -day debates in the North Atlantic Council. Of course, we were aware of those political currents. Uh, for example, the, the Macron uh, Erdogan uh, uh, public um, trading of public barbs was, was playing out in the background throughout our proceedings. Uh, the, the US election was, was looming ahead as we, we were doing this work. We were aware of those sayings, but I, I, um, I think it speaks well of uh, our process that we made a point of not letting those things um, uh, dominate our thinking. Our approach was to look ahead to the world as it's likely to be in 2030 and then reason backward to each of the three objectives that Stoltenberg had given us. So in essence, we asked, does NATO possess the, the political tools, the cohesion, the habits of consultation that it's going to need for the world of 2030. And then we drew our conclusions accordingly. The, the, the goal was to build something that would be valid, irrespective of the allow, election outcome in the United States or political events in other NATO capitals. Um, in terms of process, uh, just briefly, uh, so you know, so you understand our method here, we divided the effort into three parts. Uh, we first had a uh, purely reflection phase where, where the group brought in outside experts from academia, think tanks, uh, the tech sector, et cetera, and tried to just form a clear picture of, of the state of NATO today and then the world of 2030. We then had a consultation phase, which was pretty intensive, lasted for a couple of months. We held uh, VTCs with all 30 allied capitals, um, sessions with SACUR, NATO HQ and international staff, NATO partner capitals. I think we covered all 26, we may, maybe except one or two. And then also we did consultations with other major international organizations, uh, the European Union, United Nations, and OSCE. And then finally, we, we went through a negotiation and drafting phase where we brought all those pieces together and kind of sequestered the group off and, and, and uh, forced ourselves to hammer out some areas of compromise that were easy. It was easier to reach in some areas than others, and I can elaborate on that if there's interest. But eventually that became the main, main findings of the report. And as I said earlier, we. We presented the report to Stoltenberg uh, and the NAC in December. The process from here is that Stoltenberg will consult with allies that's going, that's going on now. He'll 
uh, collect reactions to report and then narrow it down to kind of a, a distilled uh, set of concrete proposals for the heads of state to debate and uh, hopefully in, in some cases approve at the leaders meeting at, later this year. But I want to say, uh, I think it's important to say this because I'm not assuming a high degree of interest or knowledge of, of NATO of, among everyone on the call. Just a major premise of the entire undertaking, and I, and I think it's worth stating, um, is, is the belief that, or the conviction that strategic adaptation is both necessary and possible in, in an alliance of, of NATO's size and complexity. Um, I, I think it's kind of written into the DNA of the report that international institutions and, and alliances are not in and of themselves sources of power. They reflect and ratify existing power relationships. And, and then when those underlying power relationships shift in the, in the broader strategic environment that they exist in, they inevitably have to evolve as well or they will perish. And NATO has been successful as an alliance. Uh, I'll try to say this in a way that does, a, does not come across as overly hortatory, but I think you know, it has been successful as an alliance for 70 years because of its ability from time to time to accurately read the cues of that external environment correctly. So, so every few generations, NATO re-examines how its environment uh, externally is changing and then with varying degrees of success attempts to kind of modify how it fits in that environment. That's never been only a military adaptation. It's also about adapting NATO's political ambition and role. And I think you see that in, in some of the better known inflection points in NATO, most of which had a reflection effort like this attached to them. So for example, the famous Wise Men report of the 1950s, uh, late 1950s, which followed on the Suez crisis when NATO first developed really many of the political structures and standing habits of consultation that we associate with it today. You see it in the famous Harmel report of the 1960s, uh, 1967, 68, following the loss of um, US uh, nuclear dominance when NATO began to pursue the political dual track approach that helped to pave the way for uh, Western victory in the Cold War and helped to create the foundation for uh, conventional forces in Europe treaty, OSCE, Helsinki, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then I think you also, in fairness, I think you've seen some evidence of this in the period since 2014, when G Secretary General Stoltenberg has helped to steer NATO towards a pretty far reaching transformation in, in um, adapting to a resurgent Russian military threat in the East. So I think the report should be looked at, and certainly we explicitly approached it as um, a, a, as part of this lineage of making the case for a deliberate and deliberative self-modification in, in NATO's political evolution to match its ongoing military adaptation. Most of these reports are remembered in retrospect for kind of one or two main themes. And I would submit that our report probably, in retrospect, the big message it will be remembered for is that NATO uh, urgently needs to prepare for an era of great power competition. Uh, and, and the report frames this point first analytically uh, with a fairly extensive analysis of the main geopolitical and economic trends in the world out looking out to 2030. And we felt this was really important in the group um, precisely because of the scale of, of political and economic changes that are underway in the world that distinguish the era that we're moving into a little bit, I would argue, from earlier uh, moments of, of NATO transformation. I think of Albright's group in, in particular, which I think was operating within the paradigms of a very well-established um, structure to the international system and certain you know, assumptions about the power balance being somewhat fixed at the time. I don't think those assumptions are static at all now. So we devoted a lot of uh, thought to elaborating for uh, our audience in the NAC and in NATO ca capitals exactly what is changing. And it's clear uh, uh, if you read the report that by far the most important of, of those changes is the return of intense geopolitical rivalry between large states. What, what we in the United States tend to call 
great power competition. Europeans tend to call it systemic rivalry. There's a lot of different ways to describe it. But I think the main feature of this new era, which is increasingly cl clear to everyone, is the rise of China uh, as a major um, uh, economic but also military power. And uh, it's uh, cementing of its role as a rival to the West and specifically to the United States that is on track to bypass uh, uh, the United States in major categories of national power within the coming decade. And so our, our report um, proceeds from a premise that NATO allies will have to contend with the implications of China's rise while still dealing with a militarily assertive Russia. Uh, clearly, there are other threats and challenges that will persist. Uh, the report looks, for example, at terrorism, pandemics, climate change, a few others. But a major message of our report is that not all threats are equal and not all necessarily need to be a priority for NATO specifically, uh, that NATO has to be able to prioritize. And the priority has to be protecting NATO allies against large hostile states. Um, there's a recognition in the report that the threat from China and Russia is not only military, but also ideological. These are both Eurasian, large Eurasian land powers, but they're also uh, uh, authoritarian regimes with a demonstrated desire and capacity for weakening Western public institutions and, and social cohesion from within. Uh, we also were uh, clear in outlining the differences and characteristics between these two actors. China is a full spectrum peer competitor. Uh, Russia is economically much weaker, but possesses significant military capabilities and a kind of opportunistically vengeful um, strategic cast of mind. But in military terms, the report talks about Russia as uh, remaining for the foreseeable future, the main direct uh, territorial threat to NATO. But ultimately, the message is NATO will have to have the tools to deal with challenges and threats from both of these states. And in fact, I think, I think one, of, one of the key themes from the report is that it's the confluence of the China and Russia threats that uh, confront NATO allies with a, this problem of strategic simultaneity, of, of major power threats coming at it from two directions simultaneously. And there is some novelty to that. I mean, you can go back to earlier days in the Cold War, uh, and I'm thinking of the 1950s and um, the Korean War, for example, there were real debates in NATO about U.S. force uh, allocations to uh, the, to East Asia and what that would do for deterrence in European theater. But I would argue that what we see now is on a completely different scale, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit towards the end. But I think the thing to stress for the framing of the report analytically is that the strategic environment is very different from the threat environment that NATO has known for the last two or three decades. Um, that, that's an environment. So, so the environment of the immediate post-Cold War world and then the post-9-11 <clears throat> environment that in, in geostrategic terms was arguably quite permissive. Uh, it was an environment in which NATO could reasonably assume the absence of a pure competitor to the United States and the assumption of more or less limitless financial resources. And so the ability to shape the external environment more or less at will. That's not to say that NATO didn't face threats and challenges in that period. There were, of course, the Balkan Wars and the implosion of Yugoslavia. There, were, there was the terrorist threat after September 11th. And I don't mean to um, minimize uh, th those threats, but they, the point is that those threats were different in magnitude and, 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 and kind than what we face in the decade ahead. It, it, could, it could be safe, it, th these were threats that it could, it, it could be safely assumed were surmountable on the basis of willpower. There was never any doubt about the material ability of the political and strategic West to overcome those challenges. And so in that environment, <clears throat> NATO, in my opinion, um, uh, atrophied to some extent strategically. It got out of the business of serious strategy sim simply because it didn't need strategy to cope with its environment. Its environment didn't require it. 
And in a way, I think integration and enlargement <clears throat> came to be a substitute for serious strategy. The organizing political task for NATO in that environment was how to grow the alliance <clears throat> geographically, how to use it as a tool for deepening the integration of its members in the Western political and economic system. And I'm not arguing that that was an inappropriate focus, but that <clears throat> that that, that <clears throat> the permissive strategic environment allowed it to focus uh, on those kinds of issues. It, after <clears throat> September 11th, I think crisis management uh, came to dominate uh, the culture and processes of NATO, uh, at, rather than say strategic anticipation uh, and planning at, on the scale that we saw in the Cold War. And then geographically, I, I mean, I think it's worth adding the geographical dimension to this, that the focus shifted in many ways outside the Euro-Atlantic area to the, to the sort of the global periphery to uh, North Africa, Middle East, Central Asia, Afghanistan. And a central message of our report is that all of that has changed, that the West faces serious peer competitors. It can't assume a continuation of military and, and material dominance indefinitely, that it needs to set strategic priorities and redevelop the tools and mindset of strategic competition. Um, it needs to evaluate all of its tools through the prism of this central problem set of systemic rivalries, and that it needs to, to, to focus its attention on strategic and political consolidation within the alliance itself. So using NATO as a platform for strengthening the cohesion of the political and strategic West in conditions a protracted competition with major military and ideological rivals. So against kind of that, that backdrop, let me talk a little bit about some of the main findings or, or, or recommendations that I thought were especially important in the report. <clears throat> I, 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 will, I will contextualize this by saying I think the important thing to grasp is that NATO is just beginning to wake up to the realities of the new environment that I've just described. As I said, NATO has taken some very important steps under Stoltenberg's leadership to adapt to uh, the Russian resurgence in the East since 2014, and, and, and I think those steps need to be acknowledged. But on the big fundamental questions, I think the hour is late and NATO, again, in my opinion, is, is playing catch up. Uh, but hit, hitting a few of the uh, major themes from the report, I think I would start uh, first and foremost, and Brad alluded to this, but just the urgent need for NATO to update its strategic concept. Uh, the current strategic concept was drafted in 2010, and it reflects a world that really no longer exists. It, it, was, it was drafted before Russia went into Ukraine uh, and before NATO began to grapple with the, the, the Russian methods that we've seen of uh, sort of creating territorial fait accomplis. Um, it, 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 it was, in fact, it, 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 envisioned, it envisioned Russia as a partner to NATO. So it was describing a very different relationship with, with Russia than exists now. And it doesn't even mention China. And fundamentally, I think the, the 2010 strategic concept reflects this outlook of an alliance that I was just describing, uh, the, an alliance that is kind of assured a permissive rather than contested strategic environment and enjoys kind of an easy assumption of, of, of Western military technological dominance. And, and so its chief preoccupation is with exploiting the opportunities of that environment. I've said translates into an operational focus on out of area operations against non-peer uh, opponents, uh, crisis management, enlargement, et cetera. What's needed, uh, and we spell this out in the uh, reflection report, is a revised strategic concept it takes account of the new environment. So our report recommends launching an update to the strategic concept within a year after uh, the um, uh, NATO uh, leaders meeting this spring or, or summer. And <clears throat> we, uh, we heard overwhelmingly from allies um, a desire to update rather than rewrite the strategic concept. I'm happy to elaborate on that. But I think it, that's mainly because there are certain aspects of the current strategic concept that remains serviceable. So for example, the three, the three core tasks of NATO. Um, in, in my opinion, there should be a fourth task that's something like countering instability. Um, but, but I think the, uh, a lot about the current strategic concept remains serviceable. Uh, 
uh, we have in the existing military strategies at NATO, a good starting point for forming a consensus around the new strategic uh, concept. And so I'm, I'm reasonably optimistic that this can be pulled off. And, and I think it's crucially important uh, because the strategic concept is a kind of blueprint that NATO uses in formulating all of its other strategies and doctrines and way of, ways of thinking. And there's, so there's a real trickle down effect. And you, I don't think you could run a large uh, company in the private sector without a strategic plan of some kind that reflected reality. And so that's re really the task for NATO first and foremost. Uh, sec second set of recommendations I wanna highlight on this call is, is just the, uh, the, the, the amount of energy that the report devotes to the question of the role that NATO should play on China. Um, there's a lot of talk um, in public reporting about a divergence of views on China between the United States and Europe. And I think there's some substance to that. But in reality, I, I was surprised at how easily the reflection group came to consensus on the basic description of the problem of China as <clears throat> being not just an Asia actor, um, being not just an economic actor, but posing security threats to NATO that are growing and that require NATO to play a role in addressing it. So I did not sense really much divergence at all on that fundamental question. Um, China was at or near the top of the list of concerns that we heard in virtually all of our consultations with NATO capitals. Um, I, I did not see support for NATO taking on a role in Asia Pacific. Uh, really anywhere in NATO, but I, I think the state of affairs on this question is on the question of whether NATO has a role on China broadly is in a very different place than it was even a year ago, certainly two years ago, and I attribute that partly to the effects of Chinese behavior during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, Chinese disinformation campaigns inside Europe, uh, but also just China's shift attack to a more assertive diplomatic and military behavior in Asia Pacific, uh, but also in Europe and its diplomacy in Europe. Uh, so I, I see an unmet appetite for NATO to play a far more front footed role than it does at present in dealing with the security dimensions of, of China's growing role inside the Euro-Atlantic area. And, um, I, you know, so I think the, the report deals with that uh, much more um, aggressively than would have been possible if, if this exercise had been conducted a year or two ago. Um, the report calls for, uh, for example, for, for developing a comprehensive political strategy for dealing with China, uh, creating a framework to filter out and resist uh, basically any Chinese activities that could negatively impact uh, anything inside sectors area of responsibility, communications, infrastructure, supply chains, readiness, et cetera. Uh, an, an especially important recommendation in my mind is the creation of a consultative body uh, inside NATO that would be modeled on the Cold War era COCOM structure uh, to basically coordinate policy on, 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 uh, on China. So it would, it would encompass uh, the NAC and if necessary, the European Council. And the point would be to have a venue for aerating Western security concerns on China, even when NATO may, itself may not always be the, uh, necessarily be operationalized as the tool for dealing with, with every part of the China problem set. Uh, and then finally on China, the report calls for expanding and regularizing NATO coordination with Indo-Pacific partners uh, to eventually include China. The report uh, also devotes a lot of attention to uh, emerging and disruptive technologies. Um, and the premise here is that competing with China um, to, to achieve dominance in key technologies has to be something that NATO proactively concerns itself with. Um, the report recommends that NATO perform a coordinating function on emerging technologies with military application, uh, not unlike the role uh, that it played in earlier part of the Cold War at certain points. Uh, it, that would include the creation of a new DARPA type unit inside NATO to encourage innovation in, in strategic areas and, and shared R&D 
among uh, allies. And uh, critically, I think uh, also a, um, a better method of coordination with the European Union on data regulations that impact security, um, uh, it, which is something we can talk more about. It, it, won't, it won't surprise you to hear that um, the report uh, looks in detail at Russia policy in the NATO context. Um, uh, the fact uh, here, I think the, the real constraint is that there really isn't much space for creativity uh, in, in, the, in this relationship. Every, everyone can see on a strategic basis, and the, and the group talked about this at length, that there, there could be reason in coming years to, to want a downshift in tension uh, with Russia in order to prioritize the threat from China. But in reality, there, there's no reasonable political basis for, ex for expecting or attempting a, a downshift in, in um, tensions with Russia anytime in the foreseeable future. There were a couple of NATO allies that uh, made it clear they wanted to see the reflection group provide cover for an attempt at detente with Russia, but there was really no support for this in the wider group. Um, the report basically uh, underscores a continuation of the dual track approach uh, of deterrence and dialogue, so it's, it's very conservative on this. Um, uh, but I, I mean, I think just the to the extent there's novelty in, in this section of the report, it's the it, it's it's in calling for an evolution in the current strategy so that we we don't stay stuck in the rut of you know you know basically the uh, a pro engagement block and uh, uh, a, a block within the alliance that favors strengthening deterrence, which over time I think just the interplay of those two factions in the alliance is not a healthy dynamic vis-a-vis -vis Russia. We send a lot of mixed messages. But the idea would be to raise the costs of Russian aggression um, while also ramping up diplomatic outreach. So we tried to create an opening for at least a little bit of creativity on, on Russia. But the reality is on a day-to-day -day basis, the Russians themselves consistently reject invitations for using the mechanisms that NATO has now uh, for, for, for dialogue. Um, the report looks also in, in quite a lot of detail at NATO relationship with the European Union. And I would highlight that as one of the uh, most important areas of recommendation in the group. It was also one of the most contentious sets of topics that the group discussed. Uh, my personal view is, is that the, the EU's security aspirations represent the greatest threat to the political cohesion of NATO um, over the next few years. And I think you already see this in the day-to-day -day, uh, day -day situation in the NAC where a handful of EU members of NATO increasingly withhold support for NATO efforts in order to preserve not just existing EU competencies, but basically to reserve the potential for the European Union to develop competencies in new areas in the future. Um, so the report acknowledges that the European Union's quest for strategic autonomy can become a source of institutional competition and unnecessary bifurcation within NATO. It warns against the EU developing security programs that duplicate NATO or, or discriminate against non-EU NATO members. And, and in that sense, I think, uh, reiterates principles that were articulated in the 2010 Group of Experts report. Uh, but, but in my opinion, there is an urgent need for a deconfliction mechanism of some kind in the NAC. Uh, to avoid situations more and more in the next few years, especially post-Brexit, where the EU wants to move out on new prerogatives and uh, to create space for those prerogatives, it with, withholds support for, for, Na for, for from NATO. So I, I, I would flag this as a major area of political focus for NATO in coming years. And the fact is also, I mean, I, you know, it became even more clear to me when we, we dug through all the layers of EU-NATO agreements to cooperate. There's no shortage of formal um, understandings or statements on the need to cooperate politically between EU and NATO or even templates for doing so. So we have the 74 common areas of our, our lines of, of effort. But I, my perception is, after talking to officials both at NATO and the European Union, is that these are, are, are if not a dead letter, 
then, then, it, then in practice, they're largely ignored. That on a day-to-day -day basis, there's not a lot of interaction between NATO and the European Union. And I would, I would also add that I, my perception is that the breakdown is not on the NATO side, that there is overwhelmingly a desire in NATO to rationalize and deconflict with, with the European Union. But I, I don't sense from the European Union side for a variety of reasons that there's a great desire to strengthen the relationship. Uh, but eventually, in my personal opinion, NATO and the European Union will need to develop a new comprehensive political agreement to replace uh, Berlin pr Plus. I think we've gotten just about as much tread off those tires as we can. And there, and there are obstacles to doing that, um, which we can talk more about. But my own opinion is that's the direction that we'll have to move with time. Uh, another major focus of the report uh, just coming up near the end of my list here is uh, the, is the need to take a close look at NATO decision-making processes. Uh, I think everyone knows uh, that NATO's consensus rule is sacrosanct, and that certainly came across very strongly from our consultations with allies. There's not a desire to see that fundamentally change. But I think there's also a, a recognition that co co consensus and the associated procedures around it were developed in a strategic environment of bipolarity, when there was one big obvious threat that entailed imminent invasion of the European landmass. And that really focused attention and it put natural limits on dissent. And I think what you see now is that we're trying to continue using these processes in an environment where the number of threats uh, and therefore the, the divergences in threat perception and prioritization uh, the, are multiplying. And when you have you know, two or three times the number of allies that NATO had in the 1950s. So the result, in my opinion, is that the NAC runs the risk of becoming a kind of mini United Nations, where the consultation is unwieldy, it's, it's heavily choreographed and overly formulaic. Some allies have developed a propensity for using that structure to their, uh, to the, to, to, for the purposes of importing non-NATO business, so external bilateral causes and disputes into NATO machinery and, and gumming up the process. And I think that would be undesirable in any event, but becomes more problematic in proportion to the intensity of geopolitical competition um, in NATO's external environment. So the report recommends uh, retaining consensus, but increasing the flexibility for subgroups of allies to act with uh, obviously with NAC blessing, so things would still go to a full uh, uh, consideration of the NAC, uh, uh, but without all allies necessarily having to participate in missions. Uh, it also recommends developing better tools for mitigating differentials in assessment or prioritization of threats. So for example, more frequent wargaming sessions, uh, net assessment tools, uh, forecasting scenarios in the NAC, um, using up-to-date visualization tools, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and it, and it, it recommends uh, placing a time limit on crisis decision. We, we dust, uh, crisis decision making. We, we dusted off some of the proposals that then Secretary Mattis had, had uh, sent to the NAC uh, a few years ago. And I think there's a, a recognition that there needs to be, uh, and we talk about a couple of different ways in the report of time limiting uh, the, the reaching of a decision in, in, in the NAC. And then most importantly, in my view, uh, the, recommend, the report recommends creating a higher bar for uh, recurrent single country blockages. These are becoming much more frequent. And at present, you have basically two or three allies that make up something like 90% of all single country blockages. And the report recommends just making this harder by raising the threshold of single country blockages to the minister level. Uh, so, so, so those are a few of the main takeaways uh, it, it, to my mind, I, I, I'm, I'm deliberately being general and, and kind of hitting some of the high points here. Um, but in all of these areas, the, the approach of the group was to focus on identifying what is politically and practically plausible. And I can't stress this enough. We debated a lot of good ideas. We heard great ideas from experts. Um, but if, if ideas couldn't win the support of 10 members of our group, there was a good chance they weren't going to gain the support of 30 allies. And I think that distinguishes the report from a lot of good think tank studies I've seen on NATO in the last couple of years, it's, it's not a wish list or a blue sky exercise. It's, it's rooted in, in political practicality and plausibility. Uh, because at the end of the day, you know, allied governments, all 30 governments are gonna have to sign on to uh, 
any measures that any recommendations that are going to have a chance of moving forward in the real world. So we, we tried to keep that in mind. And then maybe just in closing, I just a final observation. I mean, I, you know, speaking from an American perspective, the big challenge I see for, for NATO in coming years is stems from this problem I've described of, of strategic simultaneity, where the demands of the external environment are growing and the, cons the internal constraints, I mean, the domestic uh, constraints, uh, the, you know, in the U.S. case, the expansion of, the, of, de of, of deficit spending and the federal, de the federal debt. I think the confluence of those things will create the need for a fundamentally different transatlantic bargain than we've known since, basically since the creation of NATO. Um, I, I don't say this is a, um, a political statement so much as just an acknowledgement of reality. That the, the, the rise of China is a game changer. And it, that plus the persistence of Russia as a capable and vengeful player, to my mind, is the main problem set. And, and I think you see this if you look at the um, 2017 National Defense Strategy, the U.S. military has discarded its two war standard, as all of you know, in favor of an emphasis on fighting and winning a war with one great power adversary, uh, China. Uh, in conditions in which the United States may not possess the assumption of dominance in, in strategically significant, plausible scenarios. And, and, and that means, inevitably, in any major conflict, the U.S. will need European NATO to be, to be able to shoulder a greater deal of the burden for, for handling Russia. Um, so the ultimate goal, to my mind, has to be something like a global division of labor between the U.S., United States and Europe that allows the United States to devote more attention to the Indo-Pacific without calling into question the stability of the European theater, which I think inevitably uh, will be a secondary theater. I think the report um, does a good job of alluding to this tension, um, the strategic simultaneity problem, um, but it, it's somewhat conservative just because we were not asked to get more deeply into milita military matters. But basically, um, I, I would just close in saying, I think in light of what I've described, the fulfillment of the Wales criteria, you know, 2%, 20% metric on burden sharing, I think clearly we shouldn't define that downward. But my own view is that meeting that commitment at this point is a receding de minimis requirement. And I would favor over time um, creating a European level of ambition of some kind inside NATO. I know that is a somewhat heterodoxical statement but something that encourages the pooling and economies of scale uh, to hit, for, to allow the Europeans to better hit their capability targets, NATO capability targets, uh, and, and ease, um, uh, ease some of the, the internal duplication in, that, that already occurs. But I, I would just say that um, I, I would view that as a favorable alternative to the concept of, of European strategic autonomy in the def defense sphere, which implies a certain degree of decoupling and du duplication. So I, I'm happy to elaborate on um, any aspect of um, what I've described here today. Uh, again, I really appreciate the opportunity to join the call. Brad, thanks for having me and happy to take any questions. Well, thanks so much, Wes. Uh, there are a lot of questions in the queue. You've stimulated a great deal of interest and uh, thank you for doing so.